Now, Sigmund Freud, almost by himself, developed what we call psychodynamics. And being that Sigmund Freud developed psychoanalysis by himself, gave him a distinct problem when it came to making sure that other people believed it just the way he did. Now, this was before the application of statistics and the scientific method. Back when a single psychologist could invent an entire worldview, single-handedly. And then argue that everyone else's worldview was fundamentally wrong. And the heated arguments were seemingly endless. Greatly because people had their own worldviews and ideas of how things worked, and there was no scientific evidence to make them think otherwise. Under constant philosophical attack, early psychologists often became defensive, dug in their heels, and built walls around their ideas. Freud was among many who did just that. In Freud's idea of psychoanalysis, you had to either believe everything just the way Freud did, or you were out the door. Today, Sigmund Freud's ideas aren't commonly used in treatment, and it would be difficult to find a true psychoanalyst who only did Freudian psychodynamics. And although his belief in sexual urges at every stage of development led many heated debates, those fires have run cold now, leaving true psychoanalysis to be a relic. Though some of Freud's students, called Neo-Freudians, kept some of Freud's better ideas and developed them further into theories that would more reasonably stand up to rigorous scientific research. Keeping his general message and developing tools that we can use as a framework for developmental psychology. But as for Freud himself, he's mostly been relegated to the pages of an intro to psychology history textbook. Still, he was very important to the foundation of modern psychology. For example, he was the first person to publicly announce that who we are as adults is the result of things that happen to us, our experiences, when we're children. Freud determined this mostly from his own experiences with people, and he worked a lot with people who'd been sexually abused as children. And what he noticed was, while they acted strangely, they acted strangely in very similar ways. He noticed similarities in their actions, their dreams, and even their personalities. And then he drew conclusions based on these case studies. But he generalized them to all of human behavior. And while his methodology was not scientific, it also wasn't baseless. And while his theories are not law, some of his better theories are considered decent rules of thumb, though not law not universal phenomenon for everybody. For example, a lot of the stages that he predicts that we go through, not everyone has to go through them, or at least not in the same order. And unless we can argue that everyone goes through them in the same way, we can't fundamentally call them law. They have to be relegated to the realm of theory. For example, Freud theorized that we went through certain stages as we develop, from child into adulthood. And each stage comes with a set of criteria, or specifically, a set of things that we can or can't do. And if we pass a certain test, then we'd be at a certain stage. Or if we had a certain crisis, that means that crisis determines what stage we're in. Now, Freud's stages tended to only go from birth to age 12, because in Freud's day, a 12-year-old was effectively an adult, ready to join the workforce and almost ready to get married. So a stage where someone's about 12 years old isn't necessarily a stage in and of itself, it's more of a destination, or an achievement of adulthood. Freud's psychosexual stages begins at birth, with the oral stage. Birth to a year. This is when sucking and biting are most prevalent, and the nerves around the mouth are being developed. According to Freud, this is also when trust is formed, and failing to develop enough trust, or developing too much trust, could result in an oral complex, as evidenced by smoking or overeating. The anal stage, from about one year to about two years, has to do more with bowel movements, or keeping one's messiness inside, or becoming messy. Toilet training is the major crisis, and this is when organizational skills take hold. Or at least it's a sensitive period where organizational skills are developed a lot easier than they would be later on in life. Failure to pass through this stage could result in a person being overly organized or overly messy. It's essentially the age of the terrible twos, where a toddler learning to walk exercises the need for control of his or her own movement. And if you've tried to stop a two-year-old from running around, they're going to scream. And this is when force of will is your major crisis. Then, between five years and twelve years, we go into what's called a latency stage, when children like to ignore if there's anything that's sexual. For example, if you've ever seen a kindergartner watching a nature channel and something about sex comes up, the primary reaction is going to be, ew. Or if a child in kindergarten through third grade sees their parents kissing, 
the response is going to be ew. And children tend to group themselves according to their gender. The genital stage, or effectively 12 years old, is that arrival into adulthood. Back in Freud's day, old enough to work, old enough to marry, just about, and yet still small enough where they could get their little hands behind those machines where they could get them. The world of Freud's time was not a friendly place. But if you did happen to go through all of your stages successfully, you would be considered well-adjusted. Whereas if you failed to go through one of these stages or had a traumatic event during one of those stages, you might remain in that stage for the rest of your life in a form of arrested development, reliving that crisis over and over until the end of your days. For example, someone who may have not passed the organization stage may be messy for the rest of their lives. Or someone who learned organization too well may have learned obsessive compulsive disorder, might be stuck with an anal retentive personality for the rest of their lives. While these stages may seem to be common enough. They're far from universal. Some people may not go through all of the stages in the same order, or may skip one of them entirely. So Freud's psychosexual stages are not a law, but they are common enough that we can use them as a rule of thumb. It's a good enough theory. Now Erickson came along and took Freud's psychosexual stages and developed them into psychosocial stages, where he took a lot of the sexual emphasis out of it and created a social emphasis about it and developed it so that it extended beyond 12 years old and associated the stages to an entire lifespan that became so popular that when you take the more advanced psychology class lifespan development, Erickson's psychosocial stages are pretty much the framework that most textbooks use. Now Freud was also the first person to announce that we had unconscious drives, that we have no idea why we do what we do. His analogy was to think of the human psyche as an iceberg, and we only see the very tip of the iceberg, but beneath the water, there's a huge iceberg of unconscious drives that force us to do what we do, that we have no idea that they're even there. Because in Freud's theory, we have an entire mind of unconscious urges that we don't have access to. And the harder we try to push something down, the harder it floats back up to the surface in awkward and embarrassing ways. Now Freud described personality as having three parts. The first part is the id, and we're born with an id. And the id is what we want, and we want it now, to satisfy those urges. When we're hungry, we want to eat. When we're cold, we want to be warm. And when we're babies, when we have these urges, we want them satisfied immediately, now. That is the spirit of the id. I want it, and I want it now. Now, if all we had was the id, our world would be a very different place. We'd be stealing from each other and taking and not any consideration as to what other people feel. If you wanted something, you'd just take it. If someone else wanted that something back, they'd just take it back. This would be a world where no baby would have candy. Now, as we grow up, we incorporate in ourselves a voice of society or a parent that tells us, no, we shouldn't do that. How will we be seen if we do that? This is, in effect, the dualist perspective where you've got the id, the little devil, screaming, I want it, I want it now. And the super ego is the angel saying, oh, you better not. And the third part of Freudian personality is the ego. The person stuck in between the id screaming, I want that. The super ego saying, oh, you shouldn't. And me, the ego inside going, I don't know what to do. What should I do? What do I do? And that is the essence of the Freudian personality. If you remember anything about the cat in the hat, there was a cat who came in and the cat only wanted to play. And then there was a fish who says, oh, you better not, your mom's not here, you better clean that up, you better not play. Super ego. And then the two kids who want to play, but they also don't want to destroy anything. The ego, caught in between. Now, a fundamental aspect of the ego is that when they're caught in between the id, who wants to do things, and the super ego, who says you better not, it causes anxiety for the ego. And anxiety can crush an ego with results that go from antisocial behavior to depression. So in order to save the ego from this depression, from this anxiety, we have what's called defense mechanisms. We deflect this anxiety in several ways. And a major Freudian aspect of defense mechanisms is that we don't know we're using them. It's easier to see someone else using a defense mechanism because we don't want to admit to ourselves that we're actually using one. Now, Freud had seven major defense mechanisms, and there's a lot more than seven. But for the purposes of this graphic organizer, we're just going to do the seven. And the first of these defense mechanisms that we'll go into is called rationalization. Rationalization is coming up with a good reason. 
For example, if I asked little Timmy why he didn't turn in his homework, he might say, oh, the dog ate it. Now, that may be true. The dog may have eaten it. But still, he's making up an excuse as to why he didn't actually turn in the assignment. It's a way of deflecting some of that guilt and saying, it's not entirely my fault. I have a reason. My alarm didn't go off. When I was driving in, a chicken truck fell over and there was chickens everywhere. It's anything that keeps someone from admitting that it's entirely my fault. Now the second defensive mechanism submitted for your approval is repression or flat out denial. I didn't turn in my homework because I never got that assignment. I was right here. You never said that. That was not on the test. I was right here. That was on the test, but you never said that. I didn't do it. Nobody saw me do it. Can't prove anything. Repression. Denial. Or someone who's just been broken up with. Can't deal with it. And they repress it. You never broke up with me. That didn't happen. That couldn't have happened. A third defense mechanism is what we call regression. Or going back to a simpler time when that problem wasn't a problem. For example, I'm going back to kindergarten where we didn't have that kind of homework, where we just had nap time and all we did was color. Or when someone breaks up, or for that person who just got broken up with, I'm moving back to my parents. Or this is the one for midlife crisis, I'm going to buy a hot rod and get a girlfriend who's half my age. A fourth defense mechanism is what we call displacement or taking aggression out on someone or something they can't fight back. For example, if a bully gets beaten up at home. What's that bully likely to do? Pick on someone at school. And is that someone at school likely to be larger or smaller than the bully? Probably smaller, and that way the smaller person can't fight back. Now ideally, the bully would probably would rather beat up the parent than just beat the bully up, but we all know how that would end. So he takes his aggression out on someone who can't fight back. Another defense mechanism is what we call projection, and that's projecting the anxiety upon someone else. For example, someone who's cheating on their spouse may be likely to accuse the not cheating spouse of cheating to perhaps share that anxiety or, in essence, throw something at the wall and see if it sticks, even if there's no evidence. Or for the kid who didn't turn his homework, he could say, well, no one else turned in their homework either. Projection. Projection. A sixth defense mechanism is what we call reaction formation, and that's protesting way too much, being too vocal. If you've ever heard someone argue so intensely about something that it just seems very awkward that they're even still talking about it, that could be a reaction formation, which means they're arguing against something because they really want to convince themselves that they don't have those urges themselves. But not only are they trying to convince you that they don't want it, they're also trying to convince themselves they don't want it because they're not only trying to convince you of it, they're also trying to convince themselves. And finally, the seventh defense mechanism, and this is one of Freud's favorite, the one he preferred, is called sublimation. And that's taking that sexual energy, that anxiety, in Freud's case, that sexual energy, and channeling it into something productive. For example, Freud was very active in his work. And seeing how much of his theory is actually on sexuality, probably a lot of it was sexual frustration. And what he did was he channeled that frustration into his work, and he was a very productive guy. In fact, for a while, he was a cocaine addict because he took cocaine and realized, wow, I am getting a lot of work done. And he promoted cocaine for everyone to use. And then one day he tried to stop, and he realized how hard it was to stop. Now, Freud was the kind of person who had enough sexual frustration, enough anxiety to actually stop cold turkey because he was sublimated his energy into stopping. But when he noticed how hard it was to stop, he said, nobody should take this. And that's just how disciplined Freud for a person was. Freud's focus on sexual energy is what made him immensely popular, but it's also what made him immensely controversial and ultimately irrelevant. He designed a system of dream analysis where dreams were unfulfilled wishes. And those unfulfilled wishes were often sexual in nature, with sexual symbolism being almost universal. In that respect, a lot of what Freud considered dream analysis focused on sexual symbolism. For example, if you had a dream about a motorcycle and riding a motorcycle, that motorcycle probably represented in some form a penis. Now, in Freud's view, Anything that resembled a penis probably was a penis. However, one time, he was smoking a cigar and taking questions. 
And when the audience says, well, if you're smoking that cigar, doesn't the cigar represent a penis? To which Freud responded, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Which brings us to one major aspect of early psychologists, is that a lot of these theories were associated with other people, but the psychologist, him or herself, usually himself, was above such little things. Psychoanalysis in terms of sex was about other people, not Freud himself. Freud was also responsible for coining the Oedipus Complex, named after an ancient Greek story, where a man kills his father and marries his mother. Now many people feel anxiety when they hear this story. And to Freud, anytime you feel anxiety, that's a hint that something's being repressed. Anytime that there's nervous laughter is a hint that there's something being repressed. Now, do you want to marry your father or mother? Probably not. But the idea of it might be a little shocking. However, if you ask a young child who they want to marry, a lot of times they will say the mother or the father. So while Freud's theories may not stand up to science, there is something to them that makes them a theory. Now, the major problem with Freud's theories is that they're what's called unfalsifiable. Which means Freud had an argument to back up anything he said. For example, if Freud said something and you agreed with it, great, Freud's right. There you go. If you disagreed with it, Freud could say, you're just using a defense mechanism, you know I'm right, I'm right. And because no matter what Freud said, he was always correct, that makes it unfalsifiable. Or you can't study it scientifically because Freud's always right. You can't disprove what Freud says because Freud's always right. And that's called unfalsifiable, which means in science, we have to be able to define something in order to measure it. And we have to be able to prove it wrong because if we can't prove it wrong, then we can't study it. Now, Freud's theories may have a problem with being studied, but there's also something to them. For example, nervous laughter could be considered hiding an unconscious urge. For example, the word association test. Classic Freudian stuff. I'll say a series of words. Think of the first word that comes to mind. Ready? Here we go. Book. Car. Fire. Rock. Bird. Bee. Snow. Penis. Snow. Beaver. Now, a Freudian would be listening for your responses, and you'd probably be saying them out loud. But if you giggled at any point, that would be a cue that there's something going on there. Something you might be hiding or repressing. Now, the design of psychoanalysis would have the analyst sitting out of the field of view of the person being analyzed. The person being analyzed, the patient, would be sitting on a couch or a chair, looking off into space. And the analyst would be sitting behind the person, so that the analyst is more considered to be part of the unconscious than someone helping. Whereas in most other forms of treatment, the therapist would be in front of the person in a conversation. Our next psychological field is, is called behavior.